All right, it looks like the number of participants is kind of leveled off, so we're going to get started. Um, my name is Chris Timmis, I'm the superintendent at Dexter Community Schools. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We uh, This first time we've ever done a virtual open house. In the past, we've done state of the school district presentations. We've done presentations to talk about our programs. Usually it's like this Thursday, we're talking about kindergarten. Um, we've done specific for IB programs. We've done specific for Dread Scholars. We've done early middle college opportunities. We've talked at building transitions about going to Pinnacle or Summit or Apex, et cetera. But we've never really put it all together to explain what happens in Dexter Community Schools from six weeks old up through graduation. So this is a great opportunity. It's actually been a good opportunity for myself who, and I'm gonna to speak tonight from the lens of the superintendent, but also as a Dexter parent. And it's a really good opportunity to talk through what the programs look like in our program in Dexter Community Schools, all the way from six weeks old up through high school. So I have a presentation, we'll have the presentation available on the website after, the, after tonight, um, but I have it to go through. I'm gonna take over the screen with, with the slides. And we're going to do a couple things. The first thing I need you to do is if you have a phone or an iPad, or if you have a web browser on your computer, you can use, we're going to use a system. I want to kind of get a pulse of what people are thinking as we get started. So we're, I'm going to take over the screen and we're going to do a quick thought exchange. So our uh, virtual open house is going to start with this quick thought exchange. And the way this works is you scan the QR code or you go to tejoin.com and type in that number, the 513-738-554 and share the, to the question, what are you most interested in learning about Dexter Community Schools? So not why you're interested, what are you most interested in learning about? And it'll help me to make sure I touch on some things as we go through the presentation. So I'm going to take about four minutes for this timer. If you can do, a, do me a favor and scan the QR code and just share, what are you interested in learning about? And then what will happen if you've never used Thought Exchange before is you'll be given an opportunity to rate each other's thoughts. So I know there's participants, there's usually a lag. So you'll see some thoughts go in there and then you'll be able to rate them. So again, if you can scan the QR code, or just in a web browser, just go to the website tejoin.com and type in this number You'll and share. What do you want to learn about, about the Dexter Community School District? So there are now 25 participants. We have at least one thought, two thoughts. So if you can take some time and rate them, and what it does is it helps kind of sort it out. At about the one minute mark, I'll flip over to look at the thoughts live so we can see what people are interested in. So again, just scan the QR code or go to tejoin.com and type in that number and just share. What are you interested in learning about? Now make sure to work that into the presentation. So about a minute and a half I'll flip over because we're looking like we get, we're get we getting uh, pretty good participants and ratings getting pick, picking up as we go. After doing a couple hundred of these thought exchanges, I've noticed a pace, so I can see it's picking up like it's supposed to. So again, just uh, take your phone, turn your camera on, scan over the QR code, and it'll send you to a website, or you can just go to tejoin.com and type in that big long number. In about 15 seconds, I'm going to flip over to the screen to see the thoughts. And this is a tool we use throughout the district. It's, it's really a nice little tool. So I'm going to visualize what these thoughts look like. Um, so top rated so far, plan for opening schools in the fall. We plan to be every day, all day. Uh, fall plans every day, all day. That's an easy one. Um, Granted, there's a pandemic and who knows what's gonna happen, but that's our plan. Um, how the school days are broken down by grade and what the plan is for school, in school versus online for fall, okay. Um, student to teacher ratio. Okay, that'd be good. I can make sure to touch on that. Uh, 
Um, how are students' global perspectives widened? That is a great question. And I have making sure that I noticed I left that out of the slideshow and this is really important. I have a place we can talk about that. We also have, let's see, students teacher staff ratio. What does Dexter do differently than surrounding districts specifically for upper elementary? That we'll touch on that. Uh, what's the experience like for a student transferring into Dexter? Can touch on those. Um, what Dexter offers students as they grow through the grades? That's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. Education philosophy. I uh, wanna hear about your outside the box ideas. Happy to talk about that. Uh, ongoing plans for student return to school pathways, school choice acceptance numbers, COVID planning. Okay, this is great. This is really helpful. So I'll flip back to this at the end to make sure I didn't miss anything, but you can keep rating as we go through. So what we're going to do, I'm going to walk you through the Dexter Community School District. I'm going to talk about the history of Dexter Community Schools. Something that's really unique and it's based on our history is our campus. I'm going to talk about the Dexter Community Schools vision and our learner profile. Our uh, strategic framework, which is pretty important, it guides, guides the work we do. And then go into depth on our pathways and then talk a little bit about our new program in the works for the fall. So we're gonna start off, I'm gonna talk about athletics, arts, and academics, not in necessarily in that order. One, one area that always gets asked is in terms of school rankings and ratings. So just to give you a snapshot, we don't pri take, we don't go and advertise our rankings. We don't spend a lot of time on it other than we have a big banner on one of the buildings that's been up for like eight years. But we, uh, overall, our schools do really well. Our kids are great. Our teachers are great. Our administrators are great. It's a great community. Our Wiley, which is third and fourth grade, was ranked at the 98th percentile, Creekside at the 94th, Mill Creek at the 95th, the high school might have actually been 97th. I got to look at the sign, 97th or 98th. Um, the state doesn't rank our K-2 buildings because there's no state testing there, but overall, we do really well. Athletics, we do really well. Um, anybody that's followed school sports through the pandemic, I left off, I put 2018-19 and the fall of 2019-20. Since then, we had a winter season that was truncated without the state tournaments, a spring season that didn't happen, a fall season that started late, stopped, finished, and now we're in the winter season. So the last full seasons we've had, just to give you an idea, one quick snippet is just look at the fall of 1920. Our girls swim and dive team won the conference. Our volleyball team won the conference. Our soccer team won the conference. The football team made the playoffs. The tennis team went to the state tournament, finished 11th. Water polo was the state runner up. Boys cross country was the state runner up. Field hockey won the state title. Field hockey this fall won their second straight state title. Our swim team, our boys and our girls swim team are in the state competition every year to win, win the state. Boys, they, I think they won three or four times in a row. Girls have finished first through fourth pretty much every year in the last eight years that I know of. So athletics, we're pretty good. Actually, we're really good. Uh, in terms of arts, so we have this great publication that was just sent out. When you look at our website and when I send this presentation out, it'll be linked. It's called Dread Notes, just to give an idea of our arts. So we have at the top, we have the Pride of Dexter, our marching band, which is usually 200 students or more. Um, they are fantastic. They do a Disney trip every so many years. They go, they go across the country every so often to go and travel and perform. They do, they're absolutely phenomenal. Our choir is phenomenal starts band, choir, orchestra, start in fifth grade. We have a forensics team that does really, really well. They travel, they end up competing statewide and nationally. Our uh, orchestra does an international trip and does trips around the country. Visual arts program, we start art in uh, young fives all the way up through high school. We have the Squall, it's an award-winning student publication. So writing and speech, our drama program has 130 to 150 students in it. We do productions throughout the entire school year. This fall, they did an outdoor production. 
um, they did Sherwood, The Adventures of Robin Hood. They generally do multiple types of production, including student written and student directed productions. And then visual arts, we have programs like GraphX, which uh, are graphic design programs as part of the consortium. So really, really deep arts program that we take great pride in. So as a school district, we're about 85 square miles. We go in this V shape and it takes almost 30 minutes to drive from this corner to this corner of the district. The city of Dexter is right in the middle. Our schools are right in the middle of the city of Dexter. The city is about two square miles. So we go all the way up along the chain of lakes, all the way out to border uh, in like Green Oak Township and Northfield Township over by Whitmore Lake. We then come down around Ann Arbor and around Sio. We come down um, kind of along Zeeb area and then go all the way down to Sio Church. So district that's spread out, at one point we had a series of one room schoolhouses and you can still see some of them spread out through the, through the district. Those one room schoolhouses eventually with the school in town became the school at the Copeland building over on Dexter Ann Arbor. In the 50s and 60s, Dexter Elementary School was built. That's now Bates School, which is on Baker Road, which is the room I'm sitting or the building I'm sitting in right now. Wiley was built. It's over on Kensington. If anybody's ever been to our community pool, that's Wiley. That's the third and fourth grade building, but it was originally built as a middle school. The original Dexter High School was built. It's now Creekside Intermediate. It's on Baker Road. It's where the stadium is and the roundabouts and that whole area. Um, Copeland continued to be used as a school. In 1995, we built Cornerstone Elementary over on Dan Hoey Road, and we built Mill Creek Middle School, which is on Ann Ar Dexter Ann Arbor. In 2002, we built Dexter High School on Parker Road, and we um, move to this current configuration. So our current configuration is young fives through second grade or K2 is in at the Dexter Early Elementary com Complex, which is at Anchor and Beacon. Third and fourth is at Wiley. Fifth and sixth is at Creekside. Seventh and eighth is at Mill Creek and ninth through 12th is at the high school. In 2014, due to the generosity of the Jenkins family, we were donated the Jenkins Early Childhood Learning Center and that allows us to provide programming that starts with six week old babies all the way up through when kids start kindergarten. In 2019, we built Beacon Elementary over on Dan Hoey Road and attached it to Cornerstone Elementary. As part of that construction, we renamed Cornerstone to be Anchor. So they are Anchor and Beacon, which fits our nautical dreadnought theme. Um, we then Bates School became home to the community ed and expanded early childhood programming. The Siriani building we built over on Shield Road next to Elrit Stadium for our alternative education students. And then we are currently selling the Copeland building to the Encore Theater, and they are turning it into a uh, really a phenomenal theater. It had a great theater to begin with, but they're, uh, you can drive by and see they're in the midst of renovations. And we moved our administrative offices to the Bates School. So the best way to describe our setup, it's very unique. And this picture does it, except we the drone didn't pick up the Jenkins building, which is located right here. So all of our buildings lie on a 360 acre contiguous campus. So we have the Jenkins Early Childhood Learning Centers right here. This is Baker Road going up and down here. There's four fields. There's the border to border trail that cuts through. So Jenkins Early Elementary or Early Childhood Learning Centers here. Then we have Bates, which houses some preschool programming, community ed, and administrative offices right here. Then our students from kindergarten through second grade, including on fives, go to Anchor and Beacon, which is this complex right here. This is Dan Hoey Road. In third grade, the students go to Wiley. So it's not as if they go to a different part of town or they're by neighborhoods. They just go across the field. So they go to Wiley for third and fourth grade. In fifth and sixth grade, they go to Creekside, which is right here. In seventh and eighth grade, they go to Mill Creek, which is right here. And in ninth through 12th, they go to the high school, which is over here. Or we have some students at the Siriani building, which is right here. So I'm gonna go through some of the programming. I'm gonna start with Jenkins. So the Jenkins Early Childhood Learning Center supports children from age, from six weeks old 
all the way up through the time they start kindergarten. We do the registration for Jenkins in every March. Um, one of the differences, and we were going to do this starting last year, but we had always, like every preschool program and childcare program, been constrained by space. However, when we built Beacon Elementary and we moved the students from Bates over to Beacon and we renovated and worked through Bates, it allows us additional space. So we went into opening up childcare to our community because we knew there was a need. So our plans for fall include if a parent needs childcare and wants childcare for their child and they register when we do registration in March, if you register starting in July, we will, there won't be a waiting list. We will find space. We will hire staff. We will provide and make space. We have space at the Jenkins Early Childhood Learning Center and we have space at, space at Bates. One thing we do different as a district, and this is actually great for staff and it allows us because we are a community school district and we know not every staff member can live in the community, just the nature of housing markets. But what we do is we allow our staff to send their children to Jenkins or to our early childhood program and we do give staff discounts. So early childhood spills over into Bates, which is across the street. And what we do at Bates is we have childcare, we have aftercare, we run the early childhood special education program out of Bates, we run the Great Start Readiness program out of Bates, and then we run community education out of Bates. So we have programming that in a non-COVID year, we would run right out of Bates. So robotics, uh, Lego, Lego League, et cetera, we would run these programs out of Bates. And one thing that is, let me go back to the community ed component. So as a community, we, we go through nine different municipalities as a school district. So the school district is the recreation department. We run all of those recreation programs through community ed. We have the gyms, we have the fields, we have all of the facilities needed for a recreation department. So we run that as a school district. Now the Dexter Early Elementary Complex, this is Anchor and Beacon. So Anchor was built in 1995. And what we did when we built Beacon is we attached them and we built a twin. We liked the building so much when Anchor was Cornerstone that we just decided to build the same building and attach it. And the inside is absolutely phenomenal. What it does for us is we're allow, it allows us to have all of our young fives through second grade students attend the same school or the same schools, they're attached buildings. So the buildings meet, this was the original building from here and to the left, built in 95. This is the new building. So we have this shared space in the middle. It doesn't look anything like what it looks like inside from the outside and that was done on purpose. The entrances to the buildings are, there's an entrance to Anchor over here, an entrance to Beacon over here. This is like this great mystery space. Inside that mystery space, we designed flexible learning spaces for our kids. And what we did is we met with our teachers for months and talked to our teachers. We said, we're gonna connect these two buildings. What would you like to do academically and developmentally with your students that you cannot do in your classroom right now? And then we designed spaces to accommodate it. So we built these reading nooks so that with writable walls little kids being able to write on the wall and it erases is a great option. We put flexible furniture in there, writable tables, these little booths and these little, little seats, everything's soft and flexible. We built Tiny Town, which has barn doors and little playrooms and just gives a nice setting. We then built these little breakout areas for entire classes. There's two identical areas with projector and sound and writable walls and a seating area that can fit our five, six, and seven-year-old classes, they can, we could fit five to six classes in this one space. Then behind there, we built what we call the workshop. The workshop is a science space. And it was intended that we could hang projects from this pergola. We have a giant garage door right here where we can bring in loads of dirt for kids to play. We have a, a wet space over here with sink and materials that can handle making a mess, like we've done volcanoes in there, et cetera. We have our microscopes in there. 
over in this space. And this is for a K2 building. So these are five, six and seven year olds. We have a giant screen with soft seating with a curtain that pulls around and we can project a, we can project movies and images and videos up on this screen with full sound. It's an absolutely phenomenal space. It's been featured nationally for really, it's really just awe inspiring when you walk in it, but instructionally it allows us to do things you can't do in a normal classroom. So when we look at Anchor Elementary, we have a principal at Anchor Elementary, we have a principal at Beacon Elementary. So Mr. McCullough is the principal at Anchor Elementary. Mr. McCullough was named principal of the year in the state of Michigan several years ago. Um, at Anchor and Beacon, we offer music to all of our students as part of their specials. We do art, we have spe specific art rooms with kilns and they're great rooms. Uh, we have media, we run PE and we approach early childhood as early childhood. Our gyms at the K2 level are not basketball hoops and gym floors. They're multi-purpose rooms with carpeted floors built in an octagon shape specifically for a five through seven-year-old kid to run around in and enjoy. And then we offer language. And depending on the year, because all of our students go to the same schools together, we don't offer one language at one school and one at another. We do bands so the kids follow the same language all the way through. So we have Spanish that goes up through in two-year bands. So for example, um, this year, the second and third graders are part of the Spanish band working their way up and they'll continue with Spanish on their way up. And then we have Mandarin. So our students that are in fourth and fifth grade right now have Mandarin. They've had that since kindergarten. At Beacon, we do similar things. These are pictures of our classrooms. So you can see we have flexible furniture throughout the district. We know that kids, not like when we went in school, you just, they don't sit in desks. So we have these little hokey stools and yoga balls. And we have some normal chairs and we have tea stools and we have plate, these soft seating and writable tables and our little carpets. So they all have a seating space, but it gives you an idea of a feel of what our schools look like. At Wiley Elementary, which is third and fourth grade, that's located right behind Anchor and Beacon. So one thing we do that is very unique is we do one bus run. We pick up kindergarten through 12th grade, the entire neighborhood. We drop our students off at the high school or at Creekside, and then we pull into this bus hub. And then all of our kids walk to Wiley, Anchor and Beacon, or to Mill Creek. At the end of the day, they walk back to the bus hub. It's an extremely efficient, it's really built on our concept that we are, we went from one school, we went from one room schoolhouses to one school to one campus. All of our kids go to school together their entire careers. So when the students go to Wiley in third and fourth grade, they attend the building that is really strong with personalized learning. Our digital ecosystem allows us to have iPads in the K2, Chromebooks from three through eight, MacBooks in the high school. We have enough machines for every student. We have therapy dogs, we have green school initiatives. We do lots of work with our community and we do this personalized learning and project-based learning at Wiley that I'll talk about in a little bit that is absolutely phenomenal. Over at Creekside, which is fifth and sixth grade, this is where we, uh, we take and developmentally, we know that a lot of times you'll have kids that are in fifth grade that are in school with kindergartners and that's a drastic difference in their development so we put them together and we run a schedule that makes sense with interest that fits what a fifth and sixth grader would want to do. So we have a giant kitchen garden program where we work with the farm to school program and our kids will actually grow the vegetables. And then in an, during the school day and an after school program, they'll learn to cook using those exact vegetables and fruits that are growing in the gardens. We have community volunteers that help with the garden and some staff that help. It's a phenomenal program. We have a giant kitchen that the kids learn to kick in, cook in. My son still is an expert at making a few items that he just loves to make that he learned to make in kitchen garden. We do a survival day. We own the about 20 acres of woods along Mill Creek behind the school that has an outdoor learning lab. So the kids go out and they do survival day activities in the middle of the winter. They have the big fire next to the creek out there. It's, it's a great setting. And then we have a maker space in the building. So Creekside, it's developmentally appropriate. 
We have flexible furniture in every one of our buildings. Yeah, it's almost every classroom. We spent millions of dollars on flexible seating. And we don't just sit in the class. The kids get a ton of autonomy, but it's also developmentally appropriate. When we look at Mill Creek, just to give you an example, Oops, let me go back. Mill Creek. So the kids leave this building in fifth and sixth grade. They come back on to the other side of Baker Road and they attend Mill Creek Middle School. So Mill Creek start, they're set up in a true middle school model with interdisciplinary teacher teams. The seventh graders will have three teams of three or four teachers. They'll stay with those three or four other than doing uh, band, orchestra, choir, or doing language for high school credit or going into their exploratories, et cetera. We do a ton of activities. We have a community service and leadership program that is fantastic. They, they'll do community service. They'll go and work on in, uh, working on removing invasive species or helping clean up some of the neighborhoods and et cetera. We take all the kids to seventh grade camp right when they come in the building. And then they go off to Washington DC at the end of eighth grade for their eighth grade trip. Then the kids move on across the street. And the beauty of our campus is, is act, it is actually walkable. So students can walk. We'll have Mill Creek students that walk over to Anchor and Beacon and over to Wiley as reading buddies, or they can walk to Creekside. There's a crosswalk with a flashing beacon here with a crossing guard. And then we own all of this land with trails, walking trails that go over here. The district owns a bridge, a pedestrian bridge that with a rapid flashing beacon that allows students to cross here to get to the high school. And then we own 90 acres south of the high school, which is where our next buildings would go. So students at Dexter High School, this is a 330,000 square foot building with 1200 students. We have a turfed amphitheater. We have, it is an absolutely phenomenal and stunning building. The teachers are great at forming positive, nurturing relationships with our kids. And our kids, when I go through the programming, have any option they could have ever wanted in terms of classes and offerings and experiences. So then we have a small alternative education program, which is housed out of the Siriani building. I'll talk about the details of that program when I go through the pathways. In addition, we have always run an online program. It's been pretty small, like up to 50 students at any given time. And we run an international program. So at any given year, we'll have 30 to 40 international students from 10 to 20 countries that attend our high school and live in our community. And we also have students that take classes through us from overseas that may have been here for a year or may be looking at coming over to Dexter for a year or two. So we do some unique things. Our alternative education building is a nice little building. It is like a home away from home. The staff there, it's a 15 to 20 students and two, two full-time staff members along with some uh, itinerant staff. And they do, it's just a very unique program. If there are 15 students in the program in a given year, there are 15 different academic plans. We customize this program for any kid. Other facilities we have, our CPA seats 850 students 850 spectators, full stage. This is set up for music with the, uh, with the screening up for sound, but that is removable for our drama performances. We have two pools. We have one pool at the high school and then we have the competition community pool over at Wiley. Um, over at the high school, we have built, just to give you an idea, we have the full stadium that you see over on, uh, on Baker Road, but we also built, we have, um, tennis courts, multiple sets of tennis courts. Uh, we have softball, baseball fields. We have the Little League and softball fields that you see off of Baker Road and behind Mill Creek. But then we have a giant twin turf practice facility that you can also play games on that's lighted. It's 5.6 acres of turf. It's lined for soccer, field hockey, boys lacrosse, girls lacrosse, football, and it has markings for softball and baseball. So it's a phenomenal facility. If you ever get a chance to go up there at night with see what the lights on, it's absolutely stunning. And it allows us to run shifts of practices starting at three o'clock during the week that can go till nine or 10 o'clock at night because we just turn the lights on and we can keep going. As a district, we have developed what we call the learner profile. Several years ago, we asked our staff, we asked our parents and we asked our community and our alumni what 
characteristics, knowledge, and skills do our graduates need to be successful in life? And what they said actually fit with our district vision. Our district vision is champion learning, develop, educate, and inspire. And they said that our kids needed to be able to collaborate, be creative and critical thinkers, be able to communicate. They needed information literacy, content knowledge, and financial literacy. They needed to be kind and empathetic, have personal responsibility and resilience, and have initiative. If you click on our website, I'm going to do this real quick. On our website, we have the full profile, and you can click on any aspect of the profile to see what we mean by personal responsibility and resilience, to see what we mean by creative and critical thinkers. And then when you look down, you can look at our transfer goals by subject to see how we're organizing curriculum. So let me uh, flip, I just need to click one more space. There we go. So when we look at our learner profile, this was developed out of the work of our strategic framework. In 2015, we developed a framework that said, in order for us to truly champion learning, develop, educate, and inspire, we need to create the systems to support it, plan for our growth, work on cradle to career education, which is how we moved into offering from six week old children up, look at our instructional models, innovate and create a true community of learners. We have done community wide book studies on mental health. We're going to likely do one starting this summer on diversity, equity and inclusion. We, do, we, we did one on positive psychology. We have done, we look at the entire community has to learn together. We're in the midst of creating our new strategic plan, which would have been finished by the end of 2020, outside the pandemic, we were cruising. Um, we we're looking at how to foster vision, culture, create a learning continuum. We've built out a draft continuum of what all of those competencies look like on a zero to eight scale. So that a zero at preschool, what it looks like to communicate what it looks like for a graduate to be proficient in communication. Um, creating extended learning opportunities. And we're working right now on our strategic initiative around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now for the meat of what we do as a district. So we believe in developing, educating, and inspiring our kids. What we know about schools is there is no one path for every kid to follow. So what we've done is we've created these pathways that children can follow and pick. So our, at Jenkins Early Childhood Center, we start preschool at six weeks old. We, we have up to, at any given time, 10 to 20 babies over there. Um, they go to Jenkins up through the time they start young fives or kindergarten, where they attend Anchor, Beacon, and Wiley. And we focus on early childhood education and personalized learning models. When they go to Creekside at fifth and sixth grade, they have a choice of choosing the pinnacle model or the pinnacle pathway or the summit pathway. If they wanna change from fifth grade to sixth grade, they can change. When they go to Mill Creek, they can continue to follow a pinnacle model or go to an apex model or go to a summit model or any combination thereof. And they can always change. When we move to the high school, we have options. Our students can at their junior and senior year, will, some students will go to alter, alternative ed. Some will take AP courses. Some students will go to our early middle college, which I'll talk about in a few. They'll dual enroll. They'll go to the Early College Alliance. They'll, we have an IB diploma program. They'll go to consortium and take CTE courses, or they'll go to WAVE, which is a countywide program. And then right now we're working on, we have a group of teachers and administrators that are part of our research and development group that are creating a new learning model that'll go from preschool up through high school that we're planning on launching in the fall and piloting next month. So what we do with personalized learning, in young fives through fourth grade, and this presentation will all be available so you can go into more details, but what we do is we have an overall curriculum that we like to follow. And we use everyday math for mathematics. We do Lucy Calkins units of study for reading and writing. We use the NGSS standards and we use a workshop model. Um, we do opportunities for whole groups, small groups and individual instruction. We work a lot with social emotional learning and zones of regulation, but we really spend time at early childhood development. We use uh, iPads at K, young fives through fourth or sec, young fives through second grade, third and fourth grade, we use Chromebooks. And we utilize Seesaw 
in the earliest grades and Canvas as a learning management system in third and fourth and all the way up. Our daily work we have set up, we have a set methods for assessment or reassessment or teacher student relationships. And then at Wiley, we use this personalized learning model. And I'm gonna explain how this takes action just to tell a story. So a couple of years ago, a classroom at Wiley started looking at, because we have this campus that's connected over on Shield Road, we had a bridge that was being replaced. That bridge was jamming up traffic through the entire town. They looked at the bridge, they started studying bridges. They looked at in a place-based personalized model, they looked at the bridge and they, one of their projects the kids had to do is they had to design their own bridges in class made out of masking tape and note cards, et cetera. The bridge had to hold 29 pennies. They were given 29 pennies to purchase materials. So a piece of masking tape, for example, would be four cents. So they had to purchase the materials for 29 cents to hold 29 pennies. So they built their bridges. Then they started studying other types of bridges and the architecture behind them. They noticed a bridge downtown. And if anybody's ever seen the bridge downtown or seen a truck stuck under the bridge downtown, they, it's really a curious and fascinating bridge. So the students started looking into that bridge and these are fourth graders. And they found that Frederick Pelham, the first African-American engineering student from the University of Michigan designed that bridge and another bridge in town along with others throughout the country. So they felt that we needed to have a sign downtown that recognized the work of Frederick Pelham. So they raised money, here's the mayor helping with a bake sale and then they raised private dollars to put their sign downtown. They went to city council, they went to the Parks and Rec Commission, the school board, et cetera, to ask for permission to put up this sign. And when we did the actual ribbon cutting for the sign, the kids tracked down Frederick Pelham's great grandchildren and invited them and they attended the ribbon cutting. This is the sort of thing we're able to do in that personalized learning model in our system. When we get students that leave fourth grade and they go to fifth and sixth, they have the option over at Creekside of taking the pinnacle pathway or the summit learning pathway. Two different approaches to teach fifth and sixth grade. The pinnacle pathway does personalized and project-based with teacher-directed pacing. The summit pathway is personalized and project-based with student-directed pacing. The students can go faster or slower. There's mentoring, et cetera. We do strategies for personalization. They both use project-based learning. The pace for Pinnacle is more on district pacing guides. The pace for Summit is based on diagnostic assessment, individual group settings, and then real-time pacing guides using the Summit platform. Digital platforms, we have a deep and robust digital infrastructure. We, are, we use Canvas from third grade through 12th grade, and then we use Summit for the students in the Summit platform. There's daily work in both programs, but it's set up very different. There's assessments and reassessment, and then there's specified teacher-student relationship models. When we go, when you look at Pinnacle, and I'm gonna play a quick video and show you Pinnacle um, so that you don't have to listen to me talk the entire time, but Pinnacle uses the Canvas platform. Whoops, I went back too far. Give me one second. So Pinnacle uses the Canvas platform. So in Pinnacle, I'm going to have it. We have a short video that'll describe well, Pinnacle. Welcome, families, to Pinnacle Learning. Hello, I am Mrs. Glover. I'm a sixth grade Pinnacle teacher. Why am I passionate about Pinnacle Learning? Students in the Pinnacle platform are familiar with the materials, the workshop model, and the vocabulary. I'm able to quickly build on their pre existing knowledge and help lift them to new heights of learning, application, and responsibility. Regardless of the platform you choose here at Creekside, Pinnacle or Summit, your child will have an enriching experience here at Creekside. All teachers are in the education business, the student business. What makes a Pinnacle classroom? What are the anchors and foundations of Pinnacle Learning? What are the anchors of Pinnacle Learning? A workshop model with individual conferring between the teacher and the student. Independent work time, both as individuals and in group format. An increased personal responsibility from the students. And literacy across the curriculum 
reading, writing, listening, and speaking in all core content areas. What are the foundations of learning in Pinnacle? It starts with the workshop model. The teacher will present a mini lesson with a skill to practice. Students are then given the majority of the time to independently practice. Then there's a time to share at the end. There's an emphasis on the processes of learning. How do I learn something new? If I already know how to do something, how can I apply this knowledge in a variety of ways and to new situations? Individual conferring between the student and the teacher here, the teacher can really personalize and differentiate the learning for students. Small group learning. Again, the teacher can differentiate the learning here. Students can practice material in a smaller group setting, and these groups are flexible based on need, skills, and sometimes based on what we're reading. There's large group instruction. In this format, new material is introduced, and students spend a lot of time discussing that material. And finally, peer-to-peer -peer groups. These are mixed ability groups to help build empathy and relationship skills. How do I work with someone who's so different from myself? What is a day like in a Pinnacle classroom? What are the programs and daily activities? How do these students spend their day? Students spend their day working individually They'll also be working in a variety of group settings. They'll be conferring with their different teachers on a variety of subjects, reading and writing across the curriculum, discussing their thinking with peers, and using purposeful technology through the Google Suite and Google Classroom. Which we've now moved to Canvas since this was recorded. Didn't want to record the whole thing over just to say Canvas. What curriculum programs are used in Pinnacle? You will be familiar with these programs. We use Everyday Math with the Student Journal and the Home Links in both fifth grade and sixth grade. The Lucy Calkins Units of Study for Reading and Writing. This is where students are really lifted in their reading and writing abilities. We follow the Next Generation Science Standards. And we use TCI Alive a social studies program for both fifth and sixth grade using a textbook and supplementary materials. Social studies alive for fifth, history alive for sixth. How will my child's growth be monitored in Pinnacle? How will they be graded? Students will have many opportunities to demonstrate proficiency and growth. This can take place in a test or a quiz across the curriculum. They could be asked to write short pieces along with long formal essays on a variety of topics and again across the curriculum. Projects, both individual and group projects. Presenting their learning, both as an individual and in a group setting. And daily work and classroom activities. This is how grades are calculated in Pinnacle. Pinnacle teachers will record your child's grades in PowerSchool. You will be able to access PowerSchool and your child's grades using a unique username and password that will be included in your Welcome to Creekside materials. You should be familiar with meets, progressing, and concern. At Creekside, we add exceeds. Please note that the percentage ranges are different. In order to exceed the expectation, a student must perform between 95 and 100%. And anything 65% or below is cause for concern and indicates that intervention may be needed. We really need parent help and team in this area. Parents, please emphasize the importance of organization, communicating their needs, being independent and responsible. Make sure that students set aside the same time and the same place for nightly reading and math practice. And finally, teach your student to use their tools, classroom notes, 
the Google Suite and Classroom, their planner, and study guide. So that's the description of the Pinnacle program. Several years ago, we moved as part of uh, two, we had two schools, Creekside and Mill Creek, that became part of a national pilot of 120 schools. So we had two of the 120 called Summit Learning. Um, this is a good overview of the what Summit Learning looks like. Here's a screenshot of a platform, what the students see. So it shows it's broken down into projects, power focus areas, and additional focus areas. The Grading, 30% of the grades or the grade is actually on content. 70% is on the development of cognitive skills. So it's more of a competency base and it's a self-paced programming. I'll click on the video to show you what it, in a teacher's words, how it works. Welcome to Summit Learning. Thank you for watching this slideshow. At Creekside, Summit is taught by seasoned teachers. We are all mothers whose children either attended or still attend Dexter schools. The goal of this presentation is to help you become familiar with the program. Let's get started. Now let's dive into the three pillars of Summit Learning and what the student experience looks like. In Summit, a student's time is organized to represent the three main pillars of Summit Learning. First, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. This takes place during bi-weekly meetings with mentors. Secondly, project-based learning to build cognitive skills. This happens through project-based learning time. Finally, individualized pathways to master content. This typically takes place during personalized learning time. In order to fulfill our vision for students, the summit learning approach to teaching and learning is based on developing four key student outcomes. These are cognitive skills, content knowledge, habits of success, and finally, sense of purpose. Let's look a little more closely at those. First, cognitive skills. Summit learning emphasizes the development of students' cognitive skills. Cognitive skills equip students with essential and transferable lifelong skills to navigate college and careers. Secondly, content knowledge. Students must understand academic subjects more deeply than a web search can provide. They need a broad content knowledge base in order to put cognitive skills to work. Habits of success. Habits of success are social and emotional skills, such as resilience, social awareness, and a sense of belonging that support a student's academic and non-academic pursuits. Finally, a sense of purpose. We believe that upon high school graduation, students need a sense of purpose, an understanding of their interests, values, and skills, and a credible path after high school for translating those interests, values, and skills into a life of well-being. Now let's take a closer look at my favorite time of day, project time. Project time occurs in English, science, and history. Projects are often an amalgamation of multiple disciplines and cognitive skills into one fantastic project. For instance, students in sixth grade are currently engineering mystery boxes in science. In math, project time looks a little different. Math units are called concept units and are an opportunity for the students to engage in deeper dives into math concepts. So what are cognitive skills? Cognitive skills are how we use what we know and involve the four C's. What are those? Creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. Examples of cognitive skills include interpreting data to make valid claims or contributing to evidence-based discussions. Cognitive skills help our students to be college and career ready. An essential component of the Summit Learning Program are the habits of success. Habits of success are social and emotional skills, resilience, social awareness, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose that support a student's academic and non-academic pursuits. Summit classrooms revisit these skills often and teachers and students often discuss specific habits of success during mentoring sessions as areas of strengths, 
or areas where students need to continue to grow. In addition to projects, students work on focus areas related to the projects. Students can progress through these focus areas at their own pace. Each focus area helps students learn content through content playlists with a variety of available resources, primary sources, video text, etc. Students and teachers work together learning the content and preparing for content assessments to ensure they are practicing good study habits. The 10 question content assessments are graded in the platform and results are immediately accessible by teachers, students and parents. Students must score an 8 out of 10 on the content assessments to show mastery. Teachers can use real-time test results to easily identify which students need help on specific focus areas and provide additional support on those topics. For the content knowledge portion of a student's grade, Summit Learning measures a combination of the content assessments from power focus areas, 18%, needed to be college ready, and additional focus areas, 7%, to deepen a student's understanding for each project. It is amazing to see how students are empowered to own their learning. To guide students, we use the self-directed learning cycle. Students practice actionable goal setting by making plans, reflecting on progress, and switching strategies, if necessary, to achieve their goal. We want students to graduate with a sense of purpose and a clear path to reach their goals. I am Aiden Skronsky and I really like Project Time because it gives me the freedom to do exactly what I want as long as it's within the boundaries and we don't have to just sit down at a desk and just answer questions or something like that. It just lets us explore and do our project our way and how we think we'll get done best. He just took up every day. Let's <laughs> keep going. Okay. Um, I'm Mark, and I like project time because I, I guess we could sit wherever we want to. You know, we can go out in the hall and go in different, you know, stay in our room and, you know, go in comfy spots to do what we want to do. I, my name's Connaughton. I like project time because you can go anywhere in the room, let's get a big dose so or a dog question me, and you're not stuck at your assigned desk. All day long and have a good All right, you guys want to, oh, sorry. You guys want to show us your project? So we wrote, well, technically, Mark wrote most of this rap, and I mostly went over it. And Connor is an amazing beatboxer, so he's our music for right now. And so we work, we work on these raps, and we do one for almost every project, but we did one on poetry. We did one on our Athens of Sparta, which is our from Greece. We did a rap battle on that. And so this this is our rep, rep for Rome. It's not finished, but we're going to present it and hope it'll encourage you guys to come in the summer so you can do fun things like this. Okay, also, it might be a little bit cringy, but hold on to Let's go. Take 11 team. Back. Never have heard of Rome. If you could, would you might call it home? In this rap, you'll find the answer to that. So here we go. Let's dive into the stats. First, Rome is the environmentalist that we should discuss. We won't go very deep because, well, there's a lot of cuss. He knew this the Remus actually jumped his wall. Nobody knew he would go for that brawl. Rome was found it wasn't hierarchy. Only one leader it wasn't an oligarchy. They got tired of that and went to a republic. So the people who led. It was the public. Not much happened there until Julius Caesar. He made him a dictator, that mean little Caesar. But one thing he did that was good for them, he conquered all of Gaul all the way to Belgium. Caesar was assassinated at the end of his reign. His son justice was not to be slain. The conqueror of lands, the son of tech. They were not even getting a paycheck. No one thought that it could end. They just couldn't descend. 467 BCE. That's a time that they hit their knee. Division of country of people in Rome. And that was the start of the end of Rome. So we have uh, summaries 
on our website and in this presentation when we share it to show what what Summit and uh, make sure I get to the right screen. There we go. What Summit and Pinnacle look like and to be able to go into more depth. When we go, when our students go to Mill Creek, so they continue, they can continue on the Pinnacle path, very similar setup. They can continue on the Summit pathway, very similar setup. Or they can do what we call Apex, which is a hybrid of the two, where two of their courses are taught in the Summit model and two of their courses are taught in the Pinnacle model. It's generally uh, math and science taught as a STEM approach in the uh, summit model and then English and history taught in the uh, pinnacle model. When students go to the high school, we have a general program and the pathways are very different at the high school because kids can ebb and flow back and forth based on the courses they choose to take. So we have a general program. We're consistently ranked as one of the top comprehensive high schools in the state. Um, we, our kids, we're blessed with incredible kids, incredible staff, and incredible families. So at the high school, you get to see the culmination of what happens when those kids get to the level of independence. So we move, we have strategies for personalization, which are choosing through the curriculum options. We use Canvas and the kids will use Canvas all the way up. So they're familiar with Canvas. We have daily works assigned. We have methods for assessments and reassessment. And last night, the Board of Education voted to move us to a block schedule to allocate significant funding to move to a four by four block schedule. We're currently on a six period trimester schedule and our students take six courses at a time every day. What happens is because our students are highly motivated students, they'll take six high academic courses and get six courses worth of homework every day. Several years ago, we worked on student mental health. We worked with Dr. David Gleason. We did a community-wide book study and an internal book study. And what we looked at is ways to reduce the stress that we put on kids for their own mental health and their own emotional needs. One of the suggestions was to look at a four by four block, which would reduce the number of courses that student sees in a day, reduce the amount of homework, allows for elective courses. We will limit students in this model, we'll limit them to six AP or IB courses. So they must take two elective courses minimum. And we will, what we can do in it is it changes the chunks of time. So we can use our 5E instructional model and work in a project-based model with our kids. So opportunities we offer at Dexter High School, we have an advanced placement program. We offer, uh, we have a myriad of advanced placement classes and our student, students score extremely well on the AP exams. We also offer a full International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. Anybody that is not familiar with the IB Diploma Program, it works in two ways. Students can just take a course similar to any other high school course, or they can take the full diploma. The full diploma is built, it was designed in the uh, 1960s for diplomat students so that there was a common curriculum as they traveled around the world. The full diploma includes a series of courses they take in these six specific areas. Um, they're generally interdisciplinary minded, they're internationally minded. Um, they do a 4,000 word extended essay. They take a theory of knowledge course, which is the greatest course for any high school students. It is, why do we think how we think? And why do people think like they think? So what they may have to do in that course is try to write a persuasive, persuasive essay from three different perspectives to argue three different points, but to see every issue through the lenses of someone else's eyes. And then they have a creativity, action and service project, which is a CAS project. Um, students, we have about half to two thirds of our juniors and seniors take at least one AP or IB course. We have a wide variety of courses and we get upwards of 20 students a year that do the full diploma. We have students that take the Southwest Washtenaw Consortium courses, which we work with Chelsea, Dexter, Lincoln, Manchester, Milan, and Celine in a consortium of schools to offer career technical ed courses. We offer GraphX at our site. We're looking at an exercise science program at our site. Students can go over to Chelsea and they can participate in the health careers program. We have some programs over at Celine. We have students that come back and forth between high schools for these programs. We also offer dual enrollment our, uh, through Washington Community College. Dexter 
High School has some of the highest levels of dual enrollment of any school in the county. And we're happy to offer this option for our kids. Um, we have the alternative high school, which has a 15 to two ratio. It is, um, we started it in 2016. It was located in the Copeland building in the board office. We built the Sirianni building, named it after Louis Sirianni, who is I think 93 or 94, he's in town. Louis has a great story, very inspiring, and it is appropriately named after Louis. Um, he even has his own parking space next to Louis Gate where he works for uh, our home sporting events. Um, we have, it's self-paced, it's built 15, if there's 15 students, there are 15 different models. We work with the local Rotary Club and there's specific scholarships for students working through alternative ed to go to Washtenaw with mentors. As they go to Washtenaw Community College, we have Rotary mentors that mentor the students. We are in the first year of the Dexter Early Middle College in partnership with Washtenaw Community College, where students, it's a five-year program. They, at the end of their fifth year, they can earn both a Dexter High School diploma and a certificate through a Washtenaw Community College program or 60 transferable college credits. Other students at Dexter also attend the Early College Alliance, which is a countywide program housed at Eastern Michigan. Very similar, it's a five-year program, but it's really a four-year program that may not have the technical certificates that we offer during our early middle college. And then we have students that participate in, participate in WAVE, which is the Washington Alliance for Virtual Education. It's a full, pretty much full online program. I notice I have the typo I keep forgetting to fix. Um, it's small groups, it's housed out of Ypsilanti. They have other satellite centers. Um, we have a handful of students that attend this program. And then we are in the midst of creating a new program. And we got it, we're still working with the name. We have a name, but I don't wanna say it yet because it'll stick and we had, what do we know about names? For example, the uh, crossing island, the pedestrian island on Baker Road between Bates and Creekside Elementary. Someone once referred to it as Frogger Island. It will be forever known as Frogger Island. So we'll name this program when we're really ready to roll it out. But for now, it's an innovative learning environment. And the metaphor for it is really a road trip. So we have a group of teachers and administrators working on creating this program to launch this fall. We plan to run a pilot group of volunteer students sometime in March to really take a deep dive into the teaching philosophy of this program. The why for the program is that everyone has something valuable to add to society and our collective potential lies in nurturing our individuality. The program is designed to really foster growth and fulfillment. It's a journey and the, all of our lives journeys really depend on us taking our next most powerful move that meet our short-term goals in personal and professional lives. The structure is it's often in schools and every school wrestles with this. How do we fit everything we wanna fit into our model for kids? What we're trying to do with this program is saying, what do we wanna do for kids and what does the model look like to do that? So it'll have multi-age spans, learning studios, open classrooms, uh, it's a very dyna dynamic program, integrated content, a lot of place-based and project-based learning using an inquiry method. I talked about the helm and our learner profile. Um, it's helm referenced in the competencies. The assessment is both form is formative, it's reflective, it's authentic feedback using portfolios and community showcases. And it was really inspired by a series of books that we have read as a staff, The Element by Sir Kenneth Robinson, Dark Horse by Todd Rose. If you have not read that and you have a child or you're in education, it is one of the best reads I've had. I've, one of the best books I've ever read. And then Most Likely to Succeed by Tony Wagner. The program overall is very learner centered. It's really to foster a joyful journey of self-discovery and growth in which learners understand the value of everyone's individuality. The learners are empowered and are connected to the world in which they live. The structures are built around learner interest, voice, and choice. Instead of building learner interest into the structure, we're trying to create a program that approaches it from the learner and then builds out. And that's dependent on strong relationships between the learners and trusted adults in the community to develop confident, capable, self-directed, lifelong learners for a socially just world. What we wanna do is it won't just be teachers that are working with students, it'll be community mentors and maybe different roles that we create. So we'll be ready to roll this out soon. We're gonna pilot a uh, group in March and be asking some of our families if they're willing to have their students pilot in that group. This summer, we're also looking to launch a giant summer program. Um, ideally, what 
the concept is it'll be like a summer camp that is built so that we can have students just have fun. If I could just paint a picture and have everybody do what was in my head, what it'll be is it will be kids will come in for four hours a day, they'll leave dirty, they'll be outside, they'll be kids. They'll get to play, dabble in sports, they'll do activities together, we can do, it won't be heavy academics, but enough academics, and we're gonna make it free for our students, including transportation. Our students that attend extra community schools will be, permit, will be allowed to go for free, and then we'll have, through community ed and Camp Dexter, we'll build a uh, aftercare program because this won't go all day, but we'll put in our arts camps and the music camps and our put, we'll put athletic experiences, et cetera, all summer. So what I'd like to do now is just open up to some questions. We uh, scheduled for today, we scheduled a 7.30 meeting with our Dexter Community Schools parents to be able to talk through our plans for shifting our students to more in-person in K-6 or young five through six. And uh, so we got a little time. If you wanna ask any questions, I can open it up. Just raise your hand in the, um, and if I see a hand kind of on pause right now, we had a student, student group was supposed to go on their 